you want to take your Bibles and turn to Matthew chapter 8, that's where we're going to be in just a moment. Matthew chapter 8, as we remember Jesus together this morning. A dichotomy are two seemingly contradictory qualities that are perfectly united in someone or something. So you take two qualities that seem to be opposites, they seem to contradict, but you're able to bring those two qualities perfectly together and live both of those principles together. I have a series on God's holiness where I take dichotomies, two things that seemingly don't go together, and show how God brings both of those qualities together perfectly and demonstrates those for us. One is that God is a holy God, and yet he invites us to him. So in other words, he is a God that is set apart, right? And you think a God who is set apart doesn't want to have anything to do with those who are sinners, but he's set apart as holy, and yet at the same time, he invites us to come closer to him. Those don't seem to go together, but with God, he brings them together perfectly. In that series, I, another lesson I have entitled that God is the powerful, gentle one. How God is so powerful, and yet at the same time, He is so gentle. And those qualities don't seem to go together at first, but as you see God, He brings those two qualities together perfectly. And some people might look at God and say, how can you be righteous, just, and merciful at the same time? Again, two qualities that we have a hard time bringing together in our lives perfectly, but God shows those qualities that they don't contradict. They come together as one perfectly united in God. And if we don't understand how he's able to take these two opposing qualities and bring them together so perfectly, we really don't understand God. Jesus is the exact representation of God. So it makes sense that when Jesus came to this earth and lived a life as a human being, he showed us how to take two qualities that seem to be contrasting and unite those together in one in himself. So today we're going to look at how Jesus, as we remember him, how he was both powerful and gentle at the same time. And maybe even a more profound point is that he was gently powerful. Because sometimes the most powerful thing you could possibly do to have an impact on someone's life is not to demonstrate your power, but demonstrate your gentleness. And it's in demonstrating gentleness that it has the power to change people's lives. And Jesus was amazing at that. So I want to start out by just looking at some verses that demonstrate that Jesus was powerful. Then we'll look at a couple of verses that demonstrate that he was gentle or lowly. And then we'll look at some examples of how he brought those traits together in such a perfect way. So that's where we find ourselves in Matthew chapter 9 and verse 8. This is after Jesus has healed the paralytic man that was lowered down through the roof. And after he had healed him and says, hey, the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. And then he says, arise, take up your bed and walk. The guy takes up his bed and walk. Look at the reaction of the multitude. Now, when the multitude saw it, they marveled and glorified God who had given such power to men. See, men aren't supposed to have that much power. And so they brought, Jesus brought the power of God in the flesh. And they said, this is an amazing thing we're seeing. Two qualities that don't go together are seen perfectly in this man. In John chapter 10, this is the story or the illustration that Jesus gives about being the good shepherd. And in this illustration, he shows that a shepherd is both powerful and gentle at the same time, right? You have power if you're able to kill a wolf and kill a bear and kill a lion, right? That's a, you're, you're not some weak guy just trembling. You're out there fighting bears and lions and wolves. There's power behind that. And yet we know that the shepherd is depicted as someone gentle with his sheep and not only takes care of them, but when that sheep is lost, goes and looks for that sheep and puts that sheep on its shoulders and carries it back the quality of power and gentleness on display. And so in the middle of that context, Jesus says in John chapter 10 and verse 17, Therefore my Father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. 
I have the power to lay it down, and I have the power to take it up again. This command I have received from my Father. So not only do we see that he is expressing that I have the power to lay my life down and take it up again. That's power. But you see these two contrasts, don't you? Who in the world can lay his life down and die and has the power to take it up again? Well, Jesus had that power, and he used it on our behalf. At his trial, when the high priest is questioning Jesus, and they have all these witnesses that are coming up and testifying against him in Mark chapter 14, and they can't get any of these people to agree on a false accusation about Jesus. So the chief priest just gets sick of this charade, basically, and just flat out looks at him and says, hey, are you the Christ, the one that is chosen by God, the blessed of the Father? And in verse 62, Jesus says, I am And you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming with the clouds of heaven. There is no doubt that our Savior was, always has been, and is powerful. But he's also gentle. He's also meek. One of his famous statements, sometimes we call this the Lord's invitation, in Matthew chapter 11 and verse 28 when he says, Come to me. All you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And what does he say after that? Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And then in Matthew chapter 21, when Jesus is making his, what we refer to as triumphal entry, How he comes into Jerusalem for the last time is done in a lowly way. All this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, behold, the king is coming to you lowly and setting on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. So he didn't come on a horse. He didn't come in some powerful way. He comes in a meek way, a lowly way into Jerusalem. So let's look at a few examples where Jesus brings these traits of power and gentleness together. And I invite you to turn to Matthew chapter 5, or Mark chapter 5, I'm sorry, Mark chapter 5. Jesus has just showed his power by calming the sea. He has the power over the weather. And I remember what the disciples were like in the back of that boat. Who is this that even the winds and the waves obey his voice? When they land, they get their answer. When the demon, the guy possessed with a legion of demons, comes and says, he's the Holy One of God. And then he casts out demons from a man that no one else could control. Right? They had tried to chain him down and tie him down to, to, to control him, and nobody could do it. Jesus had the power to do that. And then he's forced to go to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, And when he gets to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, he is met by a host of people who are waiting for him. When he gets there, the ruler of the synagogue falls down at his feet and says, please come heal my daughter. She is sick and she's about ready to die. And Jesus says, I will. And so they begin this journey walking to this man's house. And in the middle of this, a woman knows the power that Jesus has. And she says... If I can just get close enough to him and touch the hem of his garment, I can be healed. And this is a woman who has spent all her money trying to get healed by doctors who were not powerful enough to do it. Livelihood, all of her money, gone. And in verse 30, we see some gentleness of Jesus here, of Mark chapter 5. And Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that power had gone out of him, turned around in the crowd and said, Who touched my clothes? But his disciples said to him, You see the multitude thronging you, and you say, Who touched me? I I just love this story, because the multitudes are just swarming Jesus. They're all touching him, right? And he's just all around him. He he lived a life that is infinitely more demanding and stressful than ours. And in that, he still had the time to be gentle. 
with people instead of being harsh and sending him away. And he takes the time to this woman to tell her that she's healed. Go in peace. Your faith has made you well. We turn back to verse 35 because the scene turns back to the synagogue ruler of the synagogue. His, his followers come to him and say, hey, don't trouble the teacher anymore because she's dead. Your daughter has died. And I love that it says in verse 36, as soon as Jesus heard the word that he spoke, he said to the ruler of the synagogue, do not be afraid, only believe. And when they get to the house, Jesus doesn't allow the rest of his apostles to go with him, just Peter, James, and John. And all these people are around mourning, and he says to them, why are you mourning? She is not dead but sleeping. They begin to ridicule him. Now, you think about this for a second. Power that is not controlled by Jesus might just strike all of them sick. Boom. You doubt me? You're all sick now. Doesn't do that. He puts them out, goes into this room in private with just the mother and the father and his three closest disciples. And then, and just, this is hard for parents, I think, to try to put ourselves here because we don't want to be there. But just imagine your 12-year-old dead. You've seen them over the last week, two weeks, get sicker and sicker and sicker. And here comes this man with all this power, has taken the time to come to your house, comes into the room where the daughter is sitting, reaches down and touches her, takes her by the hand, and he says to her, little girl, get up. And he takes her by the hand and lifts her up. And then he says, get her something to eat. She needed some food. What a gentle Jesus. What a powerful. She's saying, he is showing in this one story that he has the power, not just to heal, but the power over death. He has just recently shown he has the power over the weather. He has the power over the wind. He has the power over the lightning and the, and the thunder. He has the power over demons. He has the power over sickness. Now he is showing he has the power over death, but he cares about individual people. Another great example of this, I believe, is found in John chapter 9 where you have a blind man who had been blind since birth. And the disciples, they come upon this man and they said, man, the only question they have is who sinned that made this man blind? And Jesus says he didn't sin nor his parents sinned, but he was born blind so that the works of the Father could be seen through him. I mean, that in and of itself is an amazing thing. This guy has lived his entire life not knowing why he was blind, not knowing if his blindness served any kind of purpose. Now he has been told that his blindness actually had a very high purpose. He was blind so that through this man, you are about to see the power and, he doesn't say this, but the gentleness of Jesus. God on full display through his son. And so he makes the spittle, takes the spittle and makes the clay, puts it on his eyes, tells him to go wash in the pool. The guy goes away, washes in the pool, comes back and he sees clearly. And it causes a big stir, right? So everybody's asking, hey, is that the guy that was blind all these years? And some people, no, no, that's not him. He just looks like him. And other people say, no, that's the guy. I mean, I've seen him every day. And he goes, I'm the guy. And so they take him to the Pharisees, and the Pharisees start asking him all these questions. And like three times he has to clarify to them, I'm just telling you, this man, I don't know who he is, but he made the mud, put on my eyes, told me to go wash. I went wash, I come back, and now I see. And they ask him like three different times, and he has this funny discourse with him, this interesting discourse with him. And then finally they just get frustrated with him, and they use their power with no gentleness at all, they cast him out of the synagogue. And you know what our powerful Savior did to this man who had been cast out and had at some form been an outcast for his entire life? Look at John chapter 9, verse 35, because this is amazing. I think this is an amazing aspect of our Savior. And Jesus heard that they had cast him out. And when he had found him, Jesus went went looking for a man 
that other people had cast out. And what he is about ready to do here is give this guy some very well-needed comfort. He says to this man, do you believe in the Son of God? Now understand, this guy has just gotten his sight. He's been blind his whole life. And the only thing he has seen so far is judgment in people's eyes. The only people, thing he has seen so far is hang, anger and hatred in the eyes of the Pharisees. And now Jesus finds him and says, do you believe in the Son of God? And he says, tell me who he is and I'll believe. And Jesus says, you have seen him. For the first time, his eyes are actually looking upon God's Son. What a, what a wonderful thing that this guy could go the rest of his life knowing, I saw God's Son. And then he had the opportunity to worship Jesus. And then Jesus has a conversation with him that shows this man, you are not the outcast. You see clearly now the outcast in the kingdom of God, are the ones who use their power in a way to cast you out. They're the blind ones. And of course, that made the Pharisees livid. There are so many examples in our New Testaments about how Jesus was powerful and gentle and gently powerful. I have a list of several more that I could share with you on my outline. But what I want you to do is for the rest of our time together as we remember the Lord, I want you to think maybe of these examples or some other examples in the Bible of Jesus' life and how He used His power to help people. He used His power in a gentle way. So when Jesus was powerful, He was gentle. And then think a little bit, not just for the next few minutes, but maybe this entire week, how important it was to know that how important it is for us to know that he was not only powerful and gentle, but he was gently powerful. In other words, the gentleness sometimes was the most powerful thing that he did. And how many lessons that we can learn in our own life about that. And if we have a chance, we'll discuss that a little bit more during our Bible class.